Good morning, church. Good to have you here. A uh, couple things I want to highlight from the bulletin. Um, we've got uh, various things getting rolling. Family camp, there's a bunch more information about that in your bulletin. Also, we have the fall women's retreat. Both are happening in September. Take a look at those. Ladies' luncheons listed, prime time. So things you can check out and uh, be a part of as you desire. Uh, we also have come to the end of our summer reading program. And so the following 12 kids were involved in that. Avery Mahas, Nico Mahas, Clark Grimm, Sophie Grimm, Nora Zamancic, Alana Zamancic, Ethan Dravenstadt, Michaela Dravenstadt, Grace Gosser, Max Gosser, Stephanie France, and Tessa Underwood. The winners of the gift cards were N Nico Mahas, Alana Zamancic, and Sophia Grimm. So, congratulations to all of these kids who spent the summer doing a bunch of reading. Good job, kids. Yes. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are our God and our Savior. You rescued us from our sin and you put us on a new path to live for you. Help us to live for you day by day, moment by moment, as we make decisions, as we spend time, as we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
We read the scriptures together, we think about what they have to say for our lives, we think about our spiritual lives, our relationship with God, what he's doing in our lives, then we think about how that impacts our relationships with other people. We could go to the scriptures and say, I could find, you know, how I need to relate appropriately to my wife or to my husband, to my children, how I relate to the people in my community, how I relate to uh, people around me, the people I work with. And I could find these things and we talk about these things and routinely I'm encouraging you to take what you understand from the scriptures and live it out in your, in your actual lives. This isn't about theory. This isn't about uh, uh, just having an intellectual discussion. It's how do we understand the scriptures and then how do we live them out in our lives. But one of the relationships we don't talk about about very often is our relationship as Christians to the government. I know you're all excited now. I can see it in your eyes. You're so excited. So we're going to hit on what Paul tells Titus to do in terms of reminding the people of their relationship with the government. Then we're going to jump to Paul as he's writing to the church in Rome and then Paul when he writes to Timothy. So we're going to hit three different sections. We'll start with Titus chapter 3, and we're going to read just the first verse. Uh, You can hear what Titus is being told by Paul. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. So the first thing I want us to catch this morning is that our attitude should be an attitude of submission from Titus chapter 3. Uh, Here the focus of the the conversation turns to our relationship with the government. He says, remind the people, probably letting us know that this isn't the first time that Paul's addressed this or addressed it through Titus to the people, but remind the people. One of the great storylines in the scriptures is the forgetfulness of the people of God. God does things and people forget. God tells them things and they forget. And when they forget, they act inappropriately or they don't carry faith. God met them in an amazing way in this moment and they forget about that and they try to fix it on their own in the next moment and God says, remember. Remember what I did, right? Paul tells Titus, tell the people, remind them to be subject to the rulers. And, and I've reflected before on being in submission to, we, none of us like that. Uh, None of us enjoy that, uh, at least initially. We want to rule our own lives. We want to, we say we want to be the captains of our own ship. We want to make our decisions and do what we want to do. And we don't like to be limited, especially by governmental authority. From the health department to traffic enforcement, we want to do things our way. But actually, that's not quite true. Uh, A little detail here that I think you'll understand and appreciate. I actually do want the government to be involved in uh, bringing restraint and control on you all. Right? Just you all. So I'll give you a good example. You're late for an appointment and you look at your watch and think, woof. I'm going to have to really hammer down to get there, get in your car, you take off. You're going 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. When you're in that situation, have you ever said to yourself, why, where are all the cops? We really need a cop here. Now somebody goes speeding by you. They're going 15 miles an hour over the speed limit and you think that very thing, don't you? Where are all the police? We pay taxes. There should be someone here to stop this crazy guy driving down the road. I can't believe they're not here. So I want you to be subject to the rules. I just don't want to, right? You resonate with that? You understand what I mean? That's an indication. If you you understand what I'm saying, that's an indication that you too (laughs) don't want to submit to the authorities over you. It is and can be kind of our natural, and I will say sinful approach to authority. We really don't want people to tell us what to do. We really don't want people to enforce any laws or rules. We just want to live the way we want to live. Paul's writing at a time where the, the government is not really in opposition to the, the, uh, the, the church at this point. They really haven't started in on really uh, a lot of persecution yet uh, as much as uh, is coming. Uh, they don't really know that yet. But Paul is telling them in this time, you're to be in subject to the government and authorities over you. Uh, Jesus at one point gets confronted uh, with this question as well, similar question. It's really a question meant to trap him from Matthew 22. It says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. Did you catch that? 
They laid plans to trap the creator of the universe in his words, like they're smarter than him. What, what level of arrogance do we have here? They just really don't understand, but we're going to trap him. I'm going to come up with this scenario that Jesus can't figure out what to say. That's what they're doing. Okay, here they go. Uh, teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach what is in accordance with God and the truth. Um, you are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, how many of you wish Jesus said, no, don't pay taxes? <laughs> right? Especially you look at your pay stub, you look at it online, you're like, what? I thought I made this much, but I only get this much. What happened to this? And the answer is taxes. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used to pay tax. They brought him the denarius. And he asked them whose image is on this and what, whose inscription. They said Caesar's. And Jesus said, as you know, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Some in Jesus' day were looking for a revolutionary leader who would overthrow the government and establish a new government. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus and Paul did not advocate these things. Rather, they advocated living by a new kingdom standard, which included submitting to authorities over them. Now, I don't know if you've come across uh, folks that would consider themselves sovereign citizens, or if you're familiar with this, but it's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a movement, it's a very loose category of people. They go under different names and have different folks they, uh, they follow. But the general idea of a sovereign citizen is they believe that they are not under the authority of the United States government. I actually encountered someone, uh, actually I encountered their vehicle in a Lowe's parking lot here in Worcester one day. I pulled in and as I'm custom or uh, you know, used to doing, I'm, I'm checking out the pickup trucks and I saw this one. It had a white license plate on it and it said private in black marker. It's like I'm not familiar with the state of private, but whatever. Uh, didn't think much of it. I actually took a picture of it because I was like, what is this? And then never did anything with it. Finally deleted it. Later on, I found out that person, they consider themselves a sovereign citizen. Here are the benefits of being a sovereign citizen. You don't pay any taxes. I know some of you are now trying to figure out, how do I sign up? You don't pay any registration fees. Right? Happy birthday. Time to write a check to... The Department of Motor Vehicles, right? For every car, truck, trailer, boat, canoe, kayak, horse. Not, thankfully, not horses, sorry. Freaking Amber out. She's like, I haven't paid taxes on my horses. Uh, yeah, you got to do that. Nobody likes that, right? So they don't pay taxes. They don't pay registrations. They don't even have driver's licenses. Think of all the money you would save. So that's the upside. The downside is 100% uh, indefensible in court and all of them get hammered when they finally get in front of a judge. Right. Because it's not true. Their, their pseudo-intellectual approach to government and what is right and all that, it doesn't fly, and so they get hammered in court. But the whole point is, they believe they're not subject to authority. So you can watch YouTube videos of them being pulled over by the police. They won't have a license. They won't have registration. They'll refuse to get out of the car. They'll quote the Magna Carta, which the local police really don't care about the Magna Carta. Um, and they often get carted over to the, uh, the police station. So sovereign citizens, it's that group of people, tax evaders, we might sympathize with their position, but it's just illegal. And God doesn't call us to live in that way. Our default position in relationship to the government should be this attitude of submission. We may not like it at times, but that's what we're called to do as followers of Christ. All right, so we jump then from Titus to Romans chapter 13 because we're going to get actually uh, the rationale for why we should live in submission to the government. And so the rationale is that God has given the authority to the governmental officials. So let me read for you a little bit of Romans 13, verse 5. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. 
Do you want to be free from the, from the fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities not only because of the possibility of punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. In this passage, Paul says basically the same thing that he told Titus. Thankfully, right? Consistent. He says we need to submit to the governing authorities, but he goes on to explain why. And the reason is God has established the government authorities to do his will, and he's given them the power of the sword, the ability to punish those who are, are, are wrongdoers. When we rebel against the government, we're rebelling against God's authority. Now think of Joseph and Potiphar's wife and her uh, proposal to him. His reply is, how could I sin against Potiphar, your husband, and how can I sin against God? Because all sin is ultimately against God. The sin you commit against your neighbor is a sin against your neighbor and against God. The sin that you commit against your coworker is not just against your coworker, but against God. And so when we don't submit to the governing authorities over us, we are not submitting to what God has put into place. There is, uh, as Paul describes, a terror for those who disobey. The person who's not following the speed limit is very concerned about the little gray car that's in the median strip on 71 when we're heading south. The person going the speed limit doesn't care at all. And Paul says we should live with this peace about us because we're not violating the rulers. We're not putting ourselves in the position of getting caught doing something we shouldn't do. God has established the governments to do his will. Part of that is punishing those who do what is wrong. It is why we have such an elaborate criminal justice system in the United States. We don't fix problems amongst ourselves in this way. When they get to a certain level, the state takes over. Now, none of you, I assume, likes to pay taxes, right? Anyone here like to pay taxes? You're just thrilled. You can't wait to pay taxes. No one. Okay, we're on agreement. Okay. How many of you like to drive on roads that don't have huge potholes? I know some of you intentionally drive on roads with big potholes because you have four-wheel drive trucks and you like the adventure. The, most, the rest of us are glad not to. How many of you like it when you have a medical emergency or your house is on fire, people come who know what they're going to do to help you? Does that sound like a good idea? Well, like that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of like that too. Um, let's see, what else? Um, yeah, how many of you uh, are glad we have a public education system? Yeah, okay. That, all of that comes from tax money. That's right. That's right. So all of these things are things that we uh, receive. Although we don't like to think about it and we, we grumble against it, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we are being uh, supporting what God is up to in the midst of all of that. Paul says it's necessary to submit to these authorities not only because of the possibility of punishment, it's that final verse in the section I read, but also because of our conscience. So we shouldn't just submit to the authority of the government and the government officials above us because we're worried we're going to get caught. Right, so again, speeding is just such an easy example. So I decide I'm going to drive really fast, but I look at my Waves app and I know there's no police ahead, right? Because people are helpfully reporting in where they are. Right? You go back a couple generations, it's truckers talking about where Smoky Bear is on the road, which is a, a way to talk about the state police. Um, you know, till, oh, I can speed for a while because they're not any till then. Because they never move, by the way. You realize that? They never move. Um, but anyway, right? Paul says we should obey not just because we're worried we might get caught, but because of our conscience. God's spirit will speak to us. You've had situations where you could choose to do something where you were pretty sure no one would ever know, meaning you wouldn't get caught. And whatever it is, it's the cookie in the cookie jar. You know, right? It's watching something you shouldn't watch. It's, uh, it's glancing over at a schoolmate's um, test. You're looking at their paper to see what they wrote down. You know, all these things where you're pretty sure you're watching the teacher, they're looking away, uh, or the teacher gets called out of the room because they have to talk to somebody, and you're able to do this, and you figure, ah, no one will catch me. Conscience. 
right? Conscience is, I know I shouldn't do this, and making the choice to not do it. Paul says we should obey in those circumstances as well. Now, having said all that, there are times, rare times, where we should not obey the governing, governing authorities over us. Let me emphasize rare. Rare times. Not times where I don't like what I'm being told. That's not a rare time. That's just deciding not to submit. Not rare times where I'm just in conflict with something. Rare times when, when the governing authorities are insisting we do something that violates what God desires us to do. Let me give you a biblical example of an authority uh, dealing with somebody that they want to stop from doing something God clearly wants them to do. Peter and John get brought before the Jewish religious leaders and they have an authority, they have a power over them um, uh, in terms of being part of the Jewish community and they are upset about Peter and John speaking about Jesus. And so they say to them, look, we're going to let you go, but you can't speak or teach about Jesus anymore. And Peter and John say, oh, okay. Is that what they say? No, 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 no. Um, Acts 4. Called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19 of chapter 4 of Acts. But Peter and John replied, I wonder if they did it like Peter spoke or John spoke or did they say it in unison? Right? Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And what did they do when they left that? They went out and spoke about what they had seen and what they had heard. Our allegiance to rulers above us must be subservient to our allegiance to God himself. The caution here is that we use this appropriately and not lightly. Again, if there's a law I don't like, that doesn't mean I get to say I'm not going to follow it. If there's a decree that I don't appreciate, it doesn't mean I don't have to follow it because I don't like it. Or I come up with some convoluted way to make it sound like it's God's will for me not to obey it. But there are rare times where the government is doing something that has to be stood against. We can look back in history. A man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer in World War II at the time was a German pastor. The Nazi movement and the Nazi government had really taken over the country and had taken over many of the churches, instructing the pastors on what to do, how to do it, what to say. Uh, churches had to sign allegiance with the Nazi party. And so Bonhoeffer, as a Lutheran pastor, uh, would uh, ended up starting an underground seminary and an underground movement of pastors who would not uh, give allegiance to the Nazi party. They called it the confessing church. Uh, there's a lot written about all of that that's, uh, to me, very fascinating. On April 9th, 1945, after getting caught and put in a concentration camp for a failed plot to kill Hitler, Bonhoeffer was hung. Days before the camp he was in was liberated. They got to a place where they decided that what they should do is not obey the government but tried to dismantle it by getting Hitler and killing him. A rare occasion, right? One writer said, the obedience demanded by the state, however, is never unconditional. As we've seen with Bonhoeffer, insists that Christians are to obey the government, even ones with serious moral blemishes. In fact, the Christian's obligation to obey the government holds even when the latter, latter's integrity is in doubt. So even when there's a government where we're not super trusty of it, we're still supposed to obey. But Christians can only obey government up to a point. Bonhoeffer draws a clear line where obedience to the government is no longer required by the Christian. Quote, his duty of obedience is binding on him until the government directly compels him to offend against the divine commandment. That is to say, until government openly denies its divine commission and therefore forfeits its claim. This was written by Ronald Chai, professor at Ethos. So what he's saying is Bonhoeffer got to the decision that we're supposed to follow the government, but in this particular circumstance, the government is behaving not in line with God's will or wishes, but in an evil way, and so they stood against it. Our allegiance to Christ must come first. Our allegiance to Christ almost always is lived out in obedience to the governing authorities over us, and in rare occasions, ultra-rare occasions, that might be set aside. 
third point from 1 Timothy, our duty in relationship to government is prayer. Our duty in relationship to government is prayer. Not totally, but in part, right? Our attitude should be one of submission and reference to the governing authorities. But 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that, they may, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now, if you want to get people fired up, Talk to them about politics, right? I could start a fight in this room right now. <laughs> I could say just a couple of words, and it would be like, woo! And all of a sudden, all the Christian godliness and grace would drain away from most of you, <laughs> some of you, <laughs> and it would be, gloves on, baby, right? For all the debate for all the discussion, for all the getting together with people who think just like me and talking about how all these other people are dumb and don't know what they're doing and horrible and whatever on either side. I don't care about that and stuff. For all of that, Paul says the duty of the Christian is to pray for those in authority over us. To pray for them. So, some people would say that the church should take a stance, meaning the church should align itself with one particular party in the U.S. political system. And other people would say, oh, no, no, you should align with this party. And someone else would say, no, no, you should align with this party. So what position should the church take? Paul would say the position the church should take in reference to governing authorities is a position of kneeling in prayer. That's our duty. That's our duty for all our desires, for all our convictions, for all the, the ways in which we think it would really be great in our country if this passed, that passed, this didn't pass, this person got elected, this person didn't get elected, this person got ousted, this person disappeared forever, whatever your position is. In all of that, Paul says to Timothy, I want prayers and petitions for all people, governing authorities, rulers, kings, those people, top of the list. We should be praying for our government. Paul is, again, not writing at a time where the government is really a big problem for the church. Persecution isn't wide, widespread. The church is very small and, in the government's eyes, somewhat insignificant, although that's going to shift. But Paul says, pray. And the thing that brings conviction to me is, how often do I do this? You know, if I added up all the time I've talked to people about political things, how would that compare to the amount of time I've spent before God praying for the political leaders that I'm talking about? By the way, you could shift that over to gossip too. You can say, I, how much time do I spend talking about this person where I should be praying for them instead of talking about them, right? Or I should be talking about them, but to God, not someone else. Right? But here's the thing. How, what are we going to do? How, would we, how do we think about this? I, I was thinking in the recent, in the, in the not too distant past, the village of Smithville has had three different police chiefs. All of that has to be uh, set up, organized, orchestrated, sorted out by our village council. How often do we think to pray for our village council? Or for the village that you live in, or the town you live in, or the, if you're really, the city you live in. Because I know some of you are city people, right? So, how often do we think to pray for? How often do we pray for uh, the folks who are running our public school system, our school board members and our administrators? I was on the phone with a friend of mine. Uh, it, actually, it was the, the fellow that discipled me when I first came to Christ at Valley Community Baptist Church back in Avon, Connecticut. I, I got thinking about him this week. And uh, you can't hide because of the internet. So I found him through an organization he's a part of. I sent an email. Hey, I'd like to connect with this guy. We talked yesterday on the phone for a call, probably a couple hours. And we were talking. He's like, well, what's ministry like in, in Smithville? I said, well, the first thing you got to know is there's one stoplight. He goes, huh? So yeah, one stoplight. But he said to me, somebody goes, is it kind of rural? No, it's a city. It's all roundabouts. <laughs> it's all roundabouts. It's just all roundabouts. So uh, once I, and I said, well, the other thing you should know, because thinking about where I grew up and most other places, I said, 
You know, the school board allows us to come in and do devotions before their school board meeting. So we read scripture and pray. And he said to me, what? I said, yeah, uh, we get to come in. I've been doing it for like 25 years. We get, we get invited to come in. And he said, that's amazing. I said, I know, I know. Right? And so in that rhythm of the time, I get to go do that. Yeah, do I pray for those? Absolutely. But what about other times? When you open the newspaper, when you get online and look at news, whether it's local or regional or national, does that prompt you to pray? For an individual, for a situation, for a group of people. Uh, if you run, uh, I don't know if your prayer life runs like, a, you have a list of people you pray for, you know, maybe it's a good time to add the governing authorities, right? Whoever, right? And start at the top. Start at the bottom and work. I don't care. Paul says our duty toward the government officials, uh, in part, is about prayer. It's about lifting them up, praying for people who are ruling over us, humbling ourselves before God. And, and instead of criticizing the person who is above us, which is very easy to do, we're called to pray for them. Pray that God would use them as an instrument of his good and that they would be wise in the decisions they make. It's a challenge for us. I fear that we spend far, much, far too much time debating, talking with people about what we either agree with or talking with people and fighting with people we disagree with. Far more time is spent doing that than praying for those. Do you want to make an impact on the United States? your community, your state. Some of you might run for office, but all of you can go to your prayer closet and call on God who has instituted these authorities over us to do his work through them. Let's pray now. Father, we're uh, challenged uh, by both the, the concept of submitting because it's hard for us to do and the call to pray. And so, Father, I just want to do that now that we just begin to think about Maybe just take a moment of silence in this and, and think about and begin to pray for the people who rule over our villages and our towns and our cities, the ones we live in, that we might begin the process of praying for folks, whether we know them by name or not, whether we can name the council members or the mayor. Father, you know every one of them. So in this moment of silence, we just want to lift up these folks to you right now. And Father, we think about the state government, the state we live in here in Ohio. We, again, may not know very many names of the people that serve our state, but we want to take a moment and just pray for the state government. Father, we don't want to neglect our national government. We, we obviously all know the name of our president, Joseph Biden. We pray for him as he leads our country, that you would give him wisdom and understanding, that he would be an instrument in your hand used for your good in all ways. Whether we know and understand, agree with or not, the things that come from the administration, we ask for your work to be done. Lord, help us to live in submission to the rulers over us and help us to regularly be reminded to lift them up in prayer as we're encountering news or stories or whatever's going on that we would be moving to our needs and uh, lifting up the people who rule this world and this country, Father. And we'll give you the praise and the glory as you answer our prayers and you move in mighty and powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. No.
nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place in
Father, it's so good to be in your house, in your presence uh, as we leave this place. We don't really leave your presence, but sometimes our minds, our hearts get distracted. So help us to continually turn our attention to you, that we might live for you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.